Okay, I'll uh, make Cole ro roll call now. Uh, Council Member Braithwaite? Here. Council Member Newsma? Here. Council Member Burns? Council Member Reed? Here. Council Member Kelly? Here. We have uh, four of the five sets of quorum, sir. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh May have entertained a motion to uh, adopt the minutes from uh, our last meeting. Mr. Do you Chair, want to read the governor's order first. Oh, we're in person. Oh, we're, we're, in, person. we're in person. Yes. So, Mr. Chair, I will uh, move to approve the minutes of the January 24th, 2022 uh, Administration and Public Works Committee meeting. Second. Thank you. Is there okay? A second. Uh, can we? Uh, do a voice vote. Call it. Council Member Braithwaite. Aye. Council Member Newsma. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Council Member Kelly. Aye. And uh, Great. Council Great. Member Reed, I just want to make you aware that Council Member Burns is now uh, coming to the dais. Great. Great. As, as well, I'd be in a second. Uh, we'll continue on uh, with the consent calendar. Uh, so we'll have approval of the uh, City of Evanston payroll, bills list, and credit card activity. Uh, right here, Sean. And, uh, and uh, A2 is approval of the BMO Harris credit card activity. A3. I'd like to remove a th of item A3. Mr. Chair, I'd like to remove item A3 and A7 from consent. Perfect. Uh, A4 is approval of sole source contract with EVP Academies, LLC. A5 is approval of the agreement for sole source purchase with Spring City Electrical Manufacturing for Talmadge street light poles. A6 has been removed by Council Member Nusma. A7 is approval of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, A7 was removed, is that correct? Correct. And not A6. Correct. Okay, uh, so then A6 is approval of a single source contract award with Builders Asphalt for the purchase of hot mix asphalt. A7 has been removed. A8 is approval of change order. Sorry, approval of change order number one for the contract with Garland doing business. Can you please remove that? I'm sorry. Okay, A8 is removed. Uh, A9 is approval of change order number institute form, or institute form, technology order we will see, RFP 2125. A10 is approval of change order number three with the agreement with Stantec Consulting Services for the 1909 Raw water intake replacement RFP 1902. Can I have someone move the consent agenda? Mr. Chair, I will I will move the consent agenda with the except which uh, includes everything except A3, A7, and A8. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. Second. Mr. Stonebeck, Direct Manager Stonebeck, can you call the roll? Council Member Braithwaite. Aye. Council Member Newsma. Aye. Council Member Burns. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Council Member Kelly. Aye. All right. Uh, 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 we'll take the items that were removed from the consent agenda. Mr. Chair, you were breaking up there, but I think you uh, called for items that were removed from the consent agenda, the first of which is A3. So I will make a motion on item yes. A3, uh, approval of the sole source contract with Data Transfer Solutions, LLC, for the fiscal year 2022 ViewWorks Asset Management, Management System annual maintenance and hosting services in the amount of $32,000, not to exceed. 
Second. It's open for discussion, member. Yeah, I uh, asked that one to be removed because uh, I just have a, a few quick questions about uh, this software. As I understand it, uh, the purchase of the software was authorized in December of 2016 and scheduled for a three-year rollout. Um, and in uh, the packet that we received, it indicates that here we are five years later and there are still some assets in the facilities division which uh, have yet to be input into the system. So I just wanted to make sure we are not too far behind schedule in implementing the software and, and you know, make sure we're getting our money's worth out of the software. Thank uh, you. Uh, is there staff that can respond to that? Uh, Good evening. This is Dave Stoneback, oh, interim city manager or deputy city manager uh, and public works director. Uh, we are implementing the, the software as uh, indicated earlier. Facilities management had already entered uh, all their assets into the program. Uh, they just are not entering in uh, when the work is actually performed. And there were some challenges with getting that complete that uh, they did not have uh, tablet devices. They were using cell phones, which, you know, on the very small screen made it very challenging for them to do that accurately. And uh, they didn't maybe have as much training as, as they should have, or they had training a long time ago, and they don't, they're not current on the current training. So we're uh, making sure that our CMMS specialist, uh, Kara Pratt, is allocating her time to help them with that work now. Uh, she has been busy uh, working with the Public Services Bureau in, in getting recycling, greenways, traffic, streets, and forestry all up and, and working on the system. Uh, the water plant assets itself are, are constantly being used, and then distribution and sewer is using it as well. So. Uh, we do believe that we are getting our money's worth for that and, and producing some good information and for us to track. So we're paying for this out of the Water Bureau, but using it more broadly? That, that is true, yes. Okay. And you mentioned Kara Pratt as the CMS, CMMS? Kara? Sorry, Carrie Barnes. Is, okay. Kara Barnes is our CMMS. Got it. Uh, specialist. We have other work to give to Kara Pratt. Yes, so. we do. Okay. That's all I have. Thanks, Dave. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, with that, uh, if there are no further comments, uh, then uh, we will call the question. Council Member Braithwaite? Aye. Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Kelly? One question. Are we voting on calling the question or on the item? No, no, we're voting on the actual item. We don't have to vote to, on calling yeah. the question? No. I don't believe that there was a question, so I, I believe we're voting on. Okay. All right. Um, aye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then the next item, uh, Councilmember Newsma, uh, you also removed it. That was item A7. Yeah, I will uh, move item A7, approval of change order number one to the contract with Christopher Burke Engineering uh, for the phase three engineering services for the Howard Street Corridor Improvement Project, which was RFQ 16-75. And I had some of my questions answered uh, by staff earlier via email, but I uh, just wanted to get it on the record here today. Um, I had a question about how this cost was going to be shared with the city of Chicago, since it seems that most of the, uh, the changes that are covered by this change order uh, originated with the city of Chicago. And Thank I believe Laura Biggs is online uh, to provide a response to that. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Biggs. Um, members of the committee, my name is Laura Biggs. I'm the city engineer. So because of the nature of what caused the change orders, it really isn't entirely fair to divide it by the geography of the city owning 60% of the street. Um, towards the end of the design phase, we rushed to get the project out to bid to meet IDOT's letting schedule but also because there were concerns that funding was going to disappear if we did not get this project out to bid. And 
as we were doing that and after the contract was awarded, we did not have all of the permits from City of Chicago departments. They uh, were slow in getting their questions in. And then they had a number of comments after the project was awarded and under construction that had to be addressed. And that caused a lot of field changes that had to be incorporated by the engineer. Um, that is the majority of the change order. Uh, Chicago has agreed to pay a lot of that cost. There's also some costs associated with just um, the issue with the evergreen development. Uh, 1101 Howard Street was slow getting their um, construction complete and that also caused some design changes and that's more fairly split between um, the two entities because that wasn't due to one entity's issues. Great. So the numbers that are in our packet here, we may even be able to get more back out of Chicago. Yes, we are. We're, we're still negotiating. They're not any speedier in negotiating these changes than they were in getting the permits done in the first place. But we're we're working on it and we just don't have any guarantees. But Christopher Burke legitimately did perform the work. We hold the contract with Christopher Burke. And um, so they do deserve to be yeah, paid. So for we're on the hook. Did. We have to pay. But even though it was City of Chicago, they, they well, good luck in negotiating with them. <laughs> well, ultimately, we benefited by moving this project along quickly and getting it into construction because we received a substantial funding grant, several million dollars through the surface transportation program. And um, their funding actually dried up. And so projects that were awarded did not get the funding if they were awarded after the date that ours was. Mm -hmm. So ours was the last project awarded with the funding for the fiscal year. So okay. there was a benefit to us as well. Okay, but thank you. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, uh, Councilmember Newsom. Are there any further questions from the committee? Hearing none, uh, we will call the question on this. Uh, uh, Director, uh, Manager Stoneback, Deputy Manager Stoneback. Council Member Braithwaite. Aye. Council Member Newsma. Aye. Council Member Burns. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Council Member Kelly. Aye. Uh, all five are in favor, sir. Thank you. Uh, Seeing that that has passed, uh, we will uh, move on to the uh, items for consideration. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the sir. First... There's there's still one more item that was pulled off consent, and that is oh, item. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, a A. Yes, Council Member Braithwaite. Yes, Council Member Braithwaite. My apologies. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of uh, the committee, I'd like to move item A8, which is approval of change order number one to the contract with Garland DBS uh, for the fire station for uh, emergency roof improvements. I will second that. Okay, it's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, Council Member Braithwaite, do you have questions about yeah, this? Yeah, thank you, Dave. And my apologies, I should have called this one. So this is, an, this is just a contract extra, uh, expansion. So I didn't know when, when the first contract was, was uh, when we voted on that. Uh, it was under legislative history. It indicates that on March 22nd, 2021, City Council approved the, the original contract with Garland okay. for the emergency roof repairs at Fire Station 4. And so I probably missed it there. I was just curious, how did we end up? And I went to their website, so I see that they do a lot of municipal projects. I guess my question is no one local, whether in Evanston or in the state of Illinois, they could have performed this. And if you don't recall, then I can always touch base afterwards. I, I know that in Evanston, we really only have one roofing company that, uh, that does this type of work. And I don't, uh, they are, they generally do not pay prevailing wages uh, to their employees. So they uh, generally do not bid on projects that require prevailing wages. Okay. As to other vendors within the state, I can't say. Uh, and I again, I believe Ms. Biggs is online and not, might have more familiarity as to uh, the Garland provides the product we, oh, okay. and then they have a group of contractors that are pre-qualified. So we know what product we're getting and we know what warranty we're going to yeah. get. And then they bid the actual construction work out okay. to, to several 
contractors right. that bid on the work. Okay, familiar uh, with that model. And then this specific change order is only, it was not included the original scope of work. After we had put on the brand new roof and took care of all the emergencies right. at the next rain event, we had water <laughs> leaking into the building and it was found to be coming from a window, not from the roof. So okay. to make sure the building was tight, uh, we added this change order to replace the window as well. Makes sense. Okay. Can I, if, I would love to see that original that went out back in March that slipped by me. So you would like a copy of the? Yeah, just send to my email. Just okay. I missed it and I want to go back and review it. But I can do you. that. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. All right, seeing nothing further. Nope, got my question answered. Council Member Braithwaite. Aye. Council Member Newsma. Aye. Council Member Burns. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Council Member Kelly. Aye. Great, uh, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, we can move on to the uh, items for consideration. I have a motion for the first item for consideration. Mr. Chair, I'll move item APW1, which is commercial food. Uh, we got to do the resolution. Oh, they're, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I will move item uh, A11, resolution 10-R-22, authorizing the city clerk to sign an Illinois Department of Transportation resolution for improvement under the Illinois Highway Code and Rebuild Illinois program uh, for improvements to various Evanston streets. Uh, this is in the amount of $1,364,000, funds coming out of the Rebuild Illinois funds and the MFT fund. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and seconded. Um, are there any questions about this? No. None. Seeing great seeing none uh i'll just say uh i would like a bit more information i you know as a former clerk i'm aware that the clerk is a highway commissioner um this isn't something that came up uh during my term very much but i'd just love uh, a bit more information on this in the background um in the future all right uh seeing no further question uh manager stonebeck can you call the roll council member braithwaite aye council member newsma aye Council Member Burns. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Council Member Kelly. Aye. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I will move item A12 with your permission, sir. Uh, resolution 11-R-22, authorizing the city clerk to sign an Illinois Department of Transportation resolution for improvement under the Illinois Highway Code for improvements to various Evanston streets. Uh, and this is in the amount of $1,097,000. Thank you. Is there a second? Uh, any conversation about this? Discussion, I mean. All right, seeing none, uh, Director Stonebeck, or Manager Stonebeck, can you call the roll? Uh, Council Member Braithwaite. Aye. Council Member Newsma. Aye. Council Member Burns. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Council Member Kelly. Aye. Great. We have a motion for the next item on the agenda. Mr. Chair, I'll move item A13, resolution 14-R-22 authorizing the city manager to enter into a 10-month renewal lease agreement for studio space at the Noise Cultural Arts Center with Socorro Musino. Great. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, uh, Director Stoneberg, or we can have a voice vote on this. So all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed? None opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, may have a motion on the next item. Mr. Chair, I move item A14, Ordinance 10-0-22, amending City Code Section 3-4-6S to change the requirements of Class S liquor license holders. 
Uh, council Member Ravel requests suspension of City Council rules, so we will handle that uh, at Council. I, I do wonder if uh, the this has to be the rules have to be suspended as this didn't go through the Referrals Committee, uh, because unlike the issuance of license and some licenses in the uh, you know the subsequent policies, this one seems to be an actual policy change to just our Class S liquor license code. Good, good evening, members of the uh, Administration Public Works Committee, Chair Reed, um, Interim City Deputy City Manager Stoneback, Nicholas Cummings Corporation Council. Um, it's the law department's position that it came for, it's two, two reasons why it should stay on the agenda without a suspension of the rules. Uh, it's law department's position that it is an administrative change to the code to change the requirements, and also that it came through one of the city's other commissions, the Liquor Commission, came directly through the Liquor Commission. This is why it's on the agenda tonight and not having gone through the Referrals Commission, or Referrals Committee. Makes sense. Right, sir, I'm not sure there was a second on this I don't know if there is a second. Oh, second. Second, okay. Um, I have a different opinion. Um, I will not belabor the point now, but uh, I, I do think this is a policy change nonetheless. It's it's not the issuance of a license. It's changing the requirements. It's akin, it's akin to, you know, potentially changing any other uh, requirement for any other business. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Hearing none opposed, uh, the motion passes. Item A14 moves on to council. Item A15. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll move item A15, ordinance 12-0-22, amending city code section 3-4-6L to increase the number of class L liquor license holders from two to three uh, for Dollop HP uh, General Store and Cafe at 1508 Sherman Avenue. And I, I, I believe that's class L and not class I liquor license. Um, Yes, uh, is there a second? But, and and oh, similarly, sorry. this will be for introduction and action with the suspension of the rules at council. Yes. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, is there any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? The ayes have it, even though only one person voted. Uh, Moving on to APW1, I may have a, a um, I'm sorry. Mr. Chair? Yes. Just um, as a point for you, uh, I was informed that we do actually have members of the public that are attending via Zoom. And so I believe the- Oh, we did not have public comment. Well, not only that, but well, um, okay. I believe that Open Meetings Act, because there are members participating through Zoom, we have to continue with the roll call vote. If there were not members participating virtually, and they were here in the chamber, we could do a voice vote. But my understanding is that because there are members uh, virtually, that we need to proceed with the roll call vote. Uh, I disagree with that. I would get that if it was with the members of this body, uh, but we could allow virtual participation even outside of the uh, COVID-19 uh, restrictions. And so I'm going under the fact that, you know, we're here in person and we just allow for virtual participation uh, as, as a matter of business. We also, we also do have a couple of members for public damages. But yes, okay. Uh, and we will, uh, we'll take, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take public comment uh, at the at the end. We have two items left. How many folks are signed up for public comment? Uh, I think two of them want to speak on APW1. Okay, well then uh, we will take uh, those folks uh, now. Well, first, can I have a motion for APW1? Uh, Mr. Chair, I will move uh, that item, uh, which is a commercial vehicle uh, referral for discussion. Thank you. Uh, the item has been moved. May I have a second? Second. The item has been properly moved and seconded. Uh, I presume, uh, is there any questions from the board? Uh, I presume that uh, uh, Manager Rivera has something to share here. Uh, we'll, we'll allow, yes, Council or Councilman Ruvel. There's, there's one or two online as well. Right. Why don't so, we, why don't we go ahead? do that first. So, um, first up would be uh, Clark McCarthy. Clark yes. McCarthy. 
Feel free yeah. to. Uh, Is the board have, uh, recognized? Yes, you were recognized. Okay. Um, yeah, I was hoping to talk about uh, the residential street parking Certainly. for commercial vehicles. Um, I've been parking a commercial vehicle on our street in uh, on Lincolnwood, Ward 6, for about two years now. Um, I recently received a ticket. Um, although my I have an F-150, um, it's undersized. It had two logos on the side. Um, but I, I, I kind of saw this as a little bit of a uh, an affront to blue-collar workers in Evanston. Um, it seemed to me like uh, blue-collar workers are uh, accepted and uh, wanted in our neighborhood and our communities to do work on our businesses and homes, and then it seems like they are pretty much asked to leave. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, tonight uh, we might be able to have some comments and discourse on possibly having permits allowed for residents to park them in front of their own houses. Um, I think there definitely needs to be rules on it. Obviously, you can't, uh, we don't have semi trucks parked on everybody's front lawns, but um, I don't think it would be uh, against the rules to maybe ask residents that might have commercial vehicles for work to possibly pay a permit per year to use that, that space. Um, that's all. Yeah, thank you guys so much for listening to me. Um, thank you. And I, and I hope you stick around. I've had uh, conversations with our. Uh, parking manager, and I think you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised to, to hear the full discussion. All right, uh, who else do we have uh, for public comment? Uh, second, I believe uh, Francine Allen wants to speak to APW item two. Okay, then we'll so, call her before then. Uh, Council Member Ravel. So, excuse me, uh, good evening members of the APW committee. Um, so I'm speaking um, on behalf of a seventh ward resident um, whose previous personal vehicle had outlived its useful life and needed to be replaced. So this resident arranged with his company, Sun, Sun Run, um, to use one of the company's fleet vehicles as his personal vehicle. This vehicle, a Prius, has the company's logo on the side panel and therefore is considered by Evanston to be a, quote, commercial vehicle and therefore not permitted to be parked on a residential street overnight. Uh, my resident tried covering the company logo with a car magnet, uh, but it would not attach to the car. Uh, um, so he now has no place to park what is essentially his personal vehicle near his home. He wants to be able to park near his home, a not unreasonable expectation. Um, if he wants to do that, he needs to leave the company vehicle at work and purchase a new car. <clears throat> um, so this really adds unnecessarily to the cost of living in Evanston. I'd like to point out that as I read our city code, our definition of commercial vehicle does not mention anything about commercial markings. Uh, our code refers to the definition in the Illinois Vehicle Code, uh, and that code defines commercial vehicle based on the weight of the vehicle, whether the vehicle's used to transport nine or more passengers, uh, or whether it's used <clears throat> to transport hazardous materials. So based on that definition, I see no reason why my resident or the speaker we just heard from, why they can't park their company's cars with the company logo on the side panel, um, why they can't park in front of their homes right now. Um, so uh, the memo in your packet recommends that you consider the definition of commercial vehicle, which does seem to be advisable. We seem to be uh, having a bit of um, confusion about what, what a commercial vehicle is in Evanston. Um, the memo also warns about the, the possibility of allowing, um, you know, if we, if we allow too many commercial vehicles to park on our residential streets, that could overwhelm some neighborhoods. And so um, I, I suggest that you consider establishing a commercial vehicle permit, uh, one per residence, um, so a company so a company can't just blanket a neighborhood with too many um, commercial vehicles. But um, if, if a vehicle owner lived in, in an area with a residential parking district, the commercial vehicle permit could double as a residential parking permit. So I encourage you to consider some solution like that. 
Thank you, Councilmember Ravel. Uh, seeing no further public comment for this item, uh, come, I will first uh, allow uh, Mike Rivera to give a, an overview of this, then we'll take questions from uh, the uh, committee. Good evening, members of the committee. Um, Acting Director of Administrative Services, Mike Rivera. So pursuant to a request by Council Member Suffered and, and in light of uh, what Council Member Ravel has uh, discussed in, with regards to commercial vehicles, we have an array of vehicles in the city of Evanston. We routinely park. Um, they can be passenger vehicles. They can be light SUVs, vans, minivans, pickup trucks that um, they can have attachments to the vehicles that would in light uh, be treat, make make the vehicle be treated as a commercial vehicle. That could be ladder racks, that could be uh, plows on the front of the vehicle. It could be, um, my understanding is that it, it was lettering and, and uh, business names as well. So what I would recommend is uh, simply enough to create a vehicle uh, permit, like we have an array of permits in the city of Evanston, and I would ask, um, help on behalf of the committee to define what type of vehicles we would allow to possess this permit and what would uh, the individual applying for the permit need to do. So I'm, I'm asking if, if, if we're looking to add a permit, whether the individual owns the vehicle or not, I would recommend that they, one, have to pay an, an Evanston wheel tax, and then two, I would, I would um, ask a fee uh, comparable to what we charge all the other permits in town, uh, residential permits, which is $30 a year. $30 a year. And then I would ask for an explicit definition as to what type of vehicles, if they're going to be passenger vehicles, if they're going to be pickup trucks, if they're going to be vans, minivans. Um, and then if they're going to have, if we're going to allow any kind of apparatus to be on the vehicles, such as ladder X, uh, uh, logos, company names, addresses, plows or tow behind attachments to the vehicles. So that's that's what I'm seeking uh, this evening is for direction on that. Thank you. Council Member Newsma. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I certainly support uh, you know the right of uh, workers, whether they be blue collar or white collar or light blue collar to you know, park a, a work vehicle on city streets. Um, you know, the flip side is we don't want to turn our streets into free parking for commercial businesses and you know, all of a sudden have uh, semi trucks lined up and uh, or, or tow trucks. But I think something along the lines of what you're proposing, uh, setting some, some guidelines on what's an acceptable commercial vehicle and then a, a nominal uh, um, uh, licensing or permit fee for that makes sense. Um, in, in talking with uh, some other folks, they've pointed out that it might not always be the same vehicle. Uh, so if we're tying the permit to a tag, that might not work in all cases if, if somebody might come home with a different truck on a different day. Um, so that's a, a complicating factor perhaps. Uh, it's somewhat complicated because our, our permits are virtual, so the license plate credentials was activated into the permit base, so mm -hmm. we would activate the vehicle that they're registering today. So in the event that somebody alternates vehicle, they, they can do that, but they would certainly have to call us with anticipation and let, let the, the yeah. city collector's office know that they're going to be moving into a different vehicle. Or, I mean, we've only been doing the license plate scanner thing for a few years. Maybe for something like this, we could go back to a, a mirror hang or something like this. Um, that if somebody is using it on different vehicles, they only get one of these and it's up to them to switch it. it it's something for consideration. The problem that we had with those in the past is that, you know, those are easy to duplicate and, and it does lead to some fraud. So versus, versus have, having the, um, the virtual permit. And if you're looking for some guidance on size, like based on my quick Googling and a review of uh, relevant uh, state code that was in our packet, 10,000 pounds seems like a good starting point. I'll throw that out there if other folks have other 
ideas. Well, um, with 10,000 10, pounds, just take into consideration that that may include like a vehicle similar to like a U-Haul box moving truck. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're if we're going to allow that, it's a it's a fairly large vehicle. Some of those are somewhere about eight to nine feet in height, and then they can range in 16 to 20 feet or, or more in length. Yeah, so maybe we want to put some additional restrictions on it as well. Um, as for markings, I think we, someone with a Sunrun logo on the side of their car or you know, a business logo on the side of their car, that particularly doesn't, that doesn't bother me particularly. We don't want the Oscar Mayer Wiener mobile you know, par parked out on the street uh, you know, 365 days a year. Um, and as far as attachments, if you're looking for some guidance on attachments, my personal opinion is no trailers would have to be just one single vehicle um, and limiting the number of attachments if not uh, you know, no snow plows no uh, like maybe an, a ladder rack um, my, my recommendation would be no snow plows and, and no trailer and no items trailered at all I mean because it could be a trailer it could be like um, uh, a tree chipping you know uh, equipment that are trailered behind vehicles so I, I would recommend no no nothing being trailered to the vehicle and no snowplow attachments, no salt spreader attachments. And then with regards to demarcations, I, I would recommend uh, logos, addresses, telephone numbers, vehicle wraps, uh, magnets, things of that nature. So is that the kind of guidance you're, you're looking for? Yeah, the, the definitely. Well, what, more so the vehicle type is what I'm looking for as far as being able to include a definition. Are we gonna, are we gonna limit it to passenger vehicles and light SUVs being small, medium, and large SUVs, minivans, and vans, and pickup trucks specifically is, is what I would like to. Limiting it to those and therefore excluding a U-Haul type truck. Correct. That seems reasonable to me. It shouldn't just be my decision, of course, but. That's what the committee process is yeah, for. Exactly. Uh, I'll turn it over to anyone else who wants to weigh in. Council Member Burns. Um, you know, I think one of the con concerns that pops up is is we want to make sure that um, that businesses are accounting for their parking needs within their business plan, and um, you know that their that either their employer or place of business is accommodating them, or um, or they're finding ways within their on their property to accommodate their business needs and i think that fundamentally is the concern that i hear from from some of my residents about this particular discussion um you know if if people know that a garage is being used for storage and then they get a permit and park their commercial vehicle on the street when they could park it in the garage um you know is, is that what we want that anybody um that that is able to buy and i don't know what the the permit um would be how much are we saying for the permit uh the, the permit would mirror what we're doing with residential permits now which would be you have to register the vehicle and purchase a wheel tax which is 85 dollars, and then it's 30 dollars for the entire year you know so for 85 bucks 35 whatever it is that um you know you can use your garage or half of it for storage half of it for your personal vehicle but then still take up street parking with a with a business car um it's it's a concern, especially in certain parts of the Fifth Ward, because there's a lot of pickup trucks and and, and other commercial vehicles that are um, that are on the street. And there's already in certain areas limited parking. Older residents coming home late, having to park, you know, two blocks away. Some people with mobility challenges parking two blocks away to to get home. So, I think what I, I want to make sure is that um, is if someone does apply for the permit that they've exhausted all other options, right? Um, whether that's making sure their employer can accommodate them or, they're, or they're, they don't have space with on the, within their property, on their property to uh, accommodate this vehicle. So that's that, one one that, one that, thing I wanted to bring up. Okay, that's that's something that we can make part of the business rules for applying for the permit is that it's it's one commercial vehicle permit per household. And that would certainly um, help us have some controls in place for people not being able to register multiple vehicles to that address. 
Yeah, I mean, I've really done address my. I, I think the concern is is people not using the, the unless you know if they're in an apartment building, that's one thing. But if they have a garage to use or a parking pad or whatever it is, and they're using that for other reasons instead of using it for a business vehicle, and I don't know how we can discourage that or or you know. Um, understand before we issue a permit if those things have 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 been um, considered but i think that's a concern because we have that going on in the in the war right now and i think we want to make sure i want to make sure people have exhausted all other means to to park their commercial vehicles before um they get a permit and they're and, and they're able to park on the street so that's one concern i've heard from our residents um you, you know i think since we're having this discussion we should have it about box, box trucks too because as you know i have businesses in my ward who have box trucks and they're parking on the street and so if we're going to have this discussion let's have the full discussion because right now what's happening is um one day you can park well well one we have like designated areas within evanston where you know technically you can't park a commercial vehicle i don't think anywhere right now um of that size but we allow it on some days and other days we don't and so there's a lot of uncertainty for businesses around enforcement because they need the additional parking. They're parking these box trucks on the street. Some days they get ticketed, some they don't. So I would like to have a discussion about whether or not we're going to allow, you know, trucks that are 10,000 pounds, I think is what Councilman Renusma said, or not. Um, whether that's everywhere or if that's in designated zones, because, again, and uh, Manager Rivera, you can speak to this better than I do. There are some, like, informal we won't write it down, but we allow it areas within our city where all this is already happening. So should we just officially make those zones for box trucks and similar vehicles? To right. Park? So so formally under under the code under Section 104-5-3A, residential areas, it shall be unlawful for any person to park a commercial vehicle or bus on any block in the city in which more than one half of the buildings are used for residential purposes. This restriction shall be in effect between 9 o'clock p.m. and 7 o'clock a.m. every day. So, so that's that's currently in the code today. So currently in the code, as long as it's, there's, it doesn't, it's not over a certain threshold, you can, all, you can park legally in those areas if you have a box truck even, not just if, the smaller vehicles. But if, if more than half of the buildings are used for residential purposes, they cannot park on that block. So similarly, you see vehicles parked down the road here on Simpson and Green Bay often um, because there's not more than half of the residential, more than half of the buildings on that block are not used for residential purpose, so they, they would be able to park there. Point, point of information, can you repeat the section of code that you just cited? 10-4-5-3. It's a, so I'm just trying a. to understand, right now, Simpson, can a box truck legally park there now or not? On portions thereof of Simpson, yes. It depends okay. on the block. And it, and it, it, not just the pickup trucks or smaller vehicles, but a box truck, a big box a, truck, okay. A box truck, right. Um, I think that's all. Uh, that's all I have for now. Uh, Council Member Kelly. So, I wonder if there's any um, possibility of looking at spacing. I know in some cities they have spacing requirements, say, for rooming houses because of the potential of undermining communities if you have so many within a certain block. Is that because I hear you, Bobby, that in some blocks this could really undermine the neighborhood? Um, so is there any chance, and I, I don't know exactly how that would be rolled out in terms of who gets it or if it's a lottery or you get it for so many years, but um, where there's only so many allowed per block. A spacing um, to add some sort of a spacing um, that, to this. That, that consideration would be for vehicles 10,000 pounds or less then, correct? We're not talking about vehicles over 10,000 pounds. Right, the box, the, okay. one, the ones in question. <clears throat> I just, because I do hear you, I think in a lot of the parts of, of instance, it's just not going to be an issue because we're talking maybe one in a block or two blocks, but, but I think to protect neighborhoods where you might have a lot, perhaps we want to look at some sort of a spacing requirement like only so many per That's so many feet point. and I'll, I, that, that reminds me of something else that i think even for if someone wanted to get designated parking outside of their home isn't there a garage consideration with that whether or not you have a garage could we do something similar for this yes we we currently review that for the, the disabled parking permits mm -hmm. that um folks would apply for for 
specifically in front of their home. So that's that's one of the items that we um, investigate if they have a, a parking pad or they have their parking garage behind the home, and if they are the 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 owner of the home, and then we would make considerations if if it's a shorter distance from the front of the home to the to the curb line, or if it's shorter from the rear to the garage, and then we would make considerations if the walks uh, from the rear of the home to the to the you know to the place where they're going to park the vehicle are not wide enough to accommodate a wheelchair if they need a wheelchair to get to and from those those areas. I'd like to explore this more, but Councilmember Newsom is next. I'll go well, up to you. Okay. I mean, a point of information that. <clears throat> regardless of what we're looking to enact, if a vehicle has demarcations on it and if a vehicle is of a, of a commercial type and it's not registered, if somebody just shows up in Evanston today, you know, once this is approved, if, if it gets to the point where it's approved, if somebody shows up of a vehicle and parks it on the city street and it's it has writing and stripped and, you know, it says Mike's Construction Company on it, if that vehicle is not registered in Evanston with a paid wheel tax and a commercial vehicle permit, it's still going to be illegal, and we're going to write that vehicle for not having, being registered in the city of Evanston and, and being permitted. So under under that guise, we would have some controls, and, and and if we, and if we attach it with the residential address and we make it one per household, two per household, however many we feel is the right number, then we would have some controls as to how many vehicles per household are being registered, and if a vehicle is not registered then we would continue to cite it as we do today. I think my concern is is we we give a legal path to do it and we don't we it seems like it's hard to enforce it anyway cuz there's just so much area to cover that what'll happen is like we give a track to 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 make one vehicle to 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 make sure one vehicle commercial vehicle is legal but then if this particular person has other commercial vehicles they're still going to park those on the street it's just we've created a path where they can park one legally and they continue to park the others Right, my, the issue my residents are having, I don't think are with people who, who are coming from out of town, and parking vehicles. I think it's people that live in Evanston, and you know they they may have a, a business, um, and you know they have not just one commercial vehicle, they may have several, right. and they're using you know the streets to for parking, which I'm sensitive to that. I just I want to you know sure make sure that we have some controls around it because this is something that I've heard from the very beginning of being elected. This was sure. something that was brought up several times in different residential blocks. And, and with regards to the, the permit, the permit is actually the tool that helps us audit if a vehicle is in fact registered or not. Um, and we would do that with our license plate recognition systems and we do that pretty well now with, um, with the lakefront parking when we extend uh, free parking to individuals that have uh, Evanston wheel tax. We also do it near Northwestern on football games when we extend free parking for people that have a wheel tax. So if, if we're going to create a permit database for commercial vehicles, um, it would be easier for us to, to audit that with our license plate recognition systems and having it in, in place. And one, one that, would this include pickup trucks or just uh, what are all the vehicles that we're looking my, at? My recommendation would be passenger vehicles, SUVs, small, medium, and large, minivans, vans, and pickup trucks. That was my, that's that was my initial. And pickup right. trucks with a certain license plate, or just all pickup trucks? So how does that? Well, how does that work? The the problem that we have with with pickup trucks is that in Illinois, you can register a pickup truck as a passenger vehicle. Mm -hmm. You can register it as a, a B license plate vehicle for business, or if you put a camper top on it or a utility camp you know capper on the back of it you can also apply for uh, an RV recreational vehicle license plate so there's an array of different plates that that same vehicle can can meet in different categories and you could you could say you're using it for one thing and still be using it for commercial correct you could yeah. be using it for business 100 percent of the time and, and, and register it under personal use and just make sure you don't have any demarcations or attachments on the vehicle and any way to get around that is that an inspection kind of thing? If I mean, no. I mean, it? no. We really wouldn't be able to get around that. I mean, if somebody has an F-150 with with like a, a half tan out cover that opens and closes, and and they have let's say door magnets that they put on and off the vehicle, we wouldn't know if they were using that vehicle for commercially on a day to day basis. Yeah. So. Thank you. Uh, I try to respect the rules of chair and uh, go last. Uh, so um, I have a, a number of questions based on. The discussion here. Uh, I'll start with um, I'll start with the, the the limit per block. I have concerns with uh, limiting uh, the number of uh, of um, 
you know, as the gentleman said, you know, working class vehicles on, on a block, I think, you know, it, it essentially would ban us from having a working class neighborhood. If there was a neighborhood full of folks who just happened to be, um, you know, landscapers or whatever, and they only had one vehicle that they registered to their uh, house, then, you know, there would be a few people who would be afforded that right, and then other folks uh, would not be afforded that right, and then be able to maintain uh, residents in a particular neighborhood. So I think, um, I think we can enforce this in various ways. I don't think we need to put a limit per block. Um, and I don't think that's a good, good, good policy in this case or many others. Um, the second thing is, uh, you, uh, manager, um, Rivera, you mentioned, uh, section 10453, uh, uh, Title uh, 10, Chapter 4, 5, 3, uh, about uh, the limitation of where uh, vehicles uh, can, uh, commercial vehicles can park. I think that there are certain areas, if it's not occupied, if a block doesn't have more than 50% um, um, of, of residential housing on that block, that that block is eligible for uh, certain vehicles to park on. Uh, I think we need to have a map of that. Uh, of that, so one, we as a city know these are the blocks where folks can park, and then also, you know, so people can know. Uh, so we're just very accurately enforcing this, um, you know, because if we don't have a map of this, how do we know exactly which blocks have 50% housing and which ones don't? Um, okay, and then uh, next thing is, uh, I'm, look, I did a quick Google of, uh, vehicles that are 10,000 pounds. So a, a Dodge Ram, a 2019 Dodge Ram, which is a uh, Dodge Ram uh, 2500 pickup four-wheel drive, which I think is a, an obnoxious vehicle uh, personally, but, you know, folks are uh, apparently free to own that and drive that on the road and use it for personal use. Um, we would be banning this vehicle, which seems like it, again, could just be a personal vehicle. So I do think, and this kind of brings me to the next point, I think we have to define what commercial, now I get vehicles over 10,000 pounds, and you, when you start getting into, you know, 11 or, or 12, those vehicles are almost exclusively, uh, you know, kind of heavy duty, certainly commercial use. Uh, but I think when you creep up right to 10,000 is where you start edging out of the personal vehicles, and, um, you know, there's a small buffer at 10,000 where there still are some personal vehicles. Uh, so to, to me, that actually brings me to the definition of uh, commercial, as uh, Councilmember Ravel mentioned earlier. And, and I do think while it doesn't, our, our code doesn't mention um, uh, vehicle decals or anything like that, because those would indicate, uh, just like with any other violation of a code, uh, if you if there's evidence that a crime has been committed, you use that evidence and you uh, cite someone. So. One, I do want to be sure that someone has the possibility to come to administrative adjudication and say, hey, my vehicle is not commercial and prove that it's not. Is that correct? Or, uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, I mean, that, that would fall under the guy's, uh, you know, photo documentation. Somebody, somebody who receives a citation, they can come into adjudication and provide photo, photo documentation that their vehicle doesn't have any uh, demarcations or doesn't have attachments on it or doesn't have, uh, you know, whatever the, the, the attachments that we're ruling in or out to be, they could certainly um, contest their citations based on that photo evidence. Okay. Um, so we have a process for folks to contest whether their vehicle is commercial or not, so we afford due process. So I, I think we just have to define commercial. I'm also concerned, as I read the definition of commercial, uh, it seems that, you know, if, uh, if, if, if one of us here uh, were to pick up and decide to drive Uber, uh, you know, for a day or DoorDash or whatever it is, uh, we would then have to register a vehicle as a commercial vehicle. Is that your understanding as well? It's, there's kind of a gray area here because someone has to fully disclose that it's their intention to use the vehicle as a commercial vehicle if it's gonna be, have demarcations on it. So with Uber, oftentimes they have a light that they put on the dashboard and they have a decal that they put on the window. If somebody has a passenger vehicle and they don't display the Uber light and they don't have the sticker on the window, we, we wouldn't know that they're using that vehicle for Uber. For commercial, but legally that person, because as I read it, you know, a person who uses their vehicle for Uber or Lyft or even DoorDash or whatever, that person 
would under this code have to register their vehicle as a commercial vehicle. That's correct. And so then if we're limiting the number of vehicles that are commercial vehicles per block, if there are, you know, whatever that limit is, if we have four people on a block who are driving DoorDash and one guy who's a landscaper, we're going to, you know, if we say that the limit was five or whatever number, we're going to limit the number of people who can legally, again, even though it's hard for us to find certain actions like a, a DoorDash driver or a Lyft driver or whatever it is, um, we should create our laws in a way that they can be equally applied and enforced. And I think having those kinds of gray areas leads to uh, missing enforcement uh, and unfair enforcement under the law. And so I think we need to also work on tightening that definition of commercial vehicle and maybe ride sharing vehicles need to be taken out um, of, of this definition um, or we just need to make sure that folks know that if you are a ride share user that you need to, or not ride share user, if you're a ride share driver, you have to register legally your vehicle as a commercial vehicle. Um, Okay, so those are my comments. Point of information with regards to enforcement. So our system have, has capability today that when they issue a citation of a vehicle, they can take up to four photos. They display one on the citation, but they can take up to four photos and store it on the back end of the system. So when a vehicle does to go, if a vehicle receives a citation and somebody intends on adjudicating it, if we took multiple photos of the vehicle, we would we would take photos of the demarcations of the vehicle, we would take uh, photos if there was an attachment, uh, like a trailer or, or a plow on the front, we would take photos of that and that would all be in the in the database. So when somebody um, adjudicated the citation, uh, the, the administrative law judge would, would have access to that photo evidence in, as well and they'd be able to make a determination as to if the vehicle was in fact uh, deemed commercial or, or passenger at that point when the, when the actual citation was written. Thank you. Thank you, well, Councilmember Burns. Yeah, I mean, and this is just discussion, so we could talk about this more offline as well. But I just wanted to be clear that that to me, I, the person who um, has, let's say, one vehicle and is using it for commercial use as well as kind of personal use, I think is a great candidate for this. Like, I have no no issues with that person, right? One vehicle, you know, uh, uh, by day it's this vehicle, by night it's this vehicle. Perfect, you can get a permit, right? Uh, someone who doesn't have like a garage or a, a parking pad, et cetera, somebody who lives in a building, of course, um, that's a that's a that's a perfect candidate for this. I think what I'm trying to control for is someone that may have two personal vehicles, you know, two or three commercial vehicles, and right now they're already parking those on the street. They have not found um, permanent uh, uh, parking elsewhere offsite for for that vehicle, but they're using the the residential streets to do it. That, that's what I'm trying to control for, which this conversation has helped me kind of better understand how we may do that, and, and I'll probably have more questions as, as this discussion continues. But I just want to be very clear that I'm not – I have no concern about the, the Uber driver, you know, that's – what so it, I'm just saying it says it here in the code. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, I'm not yeah, saying it doesn't. Yeah. I'm just being clear kind of where I'm at. I have – I'm not worried about that person at all. Right, and, and, and I mean, just to reiterate, again, today if a vehicle has passenger – license plates on it and it's a pickup truck or a minivan or just a, a vehicle and we would treat it as a passenger vehicle um, but if, if we have pickup trucks out there parked today with ladder racks and snow plows and attachments and things of that that are that, that are used for commercial purposes then that vehicle would be deemed commercial it would, it would be cited so again those individuals that are that are using passenger license plate vehicles for dual purpose like uber and you know, uh, ride share, food delivery, things of that nature, they can still continue to do that. Um, we wouldn't be able to tell if they're doing that or not. But for the individuals that have small construction businesses that are residents or, or landscape businesses or a tradesman who works in Evanston who his employer provides him a vehicle, a take-home vehicle, that vehicle may be registered in Wisconsin, let's say, and it's a fleet and they're able to take it home. So then that we would be asking those individuals that have clearly demarcated vehicles, you know, logos, addresses, telephone numbers, uh, you know, attachments, if we're going to allow certain attachments like, like ladder racks, to come forward and say, I have a commercial vehicle that I want to register to my home and allow them to register what number of vehicles, one, two, three, to that home, and then have them pay for one year's wheel tax, the $30 uh, permit fee, that would make them eligible to park anywhere in the Evanston city limits. And if they have, uh, and, and if where they live also 
has a residential parking district, then that would give them qualifications for that district as well, being the license plate number. And, uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to maybe get consensus from the committee, because uh, I presume, Mike, you're, or Director uh, Manager uh, Rivera, I presume you're going to bring uh, um, uh, an ordinance back to us in the next couple weeks, months, whatever. That is correct. Okay. Uh, so I do want to get some clarification. Does it seem it is the desire of this committee to exclude uh, rideshare users or rideshare drivers from the commercial vehicle definition? Yes. Okay. Um, but I also do want to note that there's outside of uh, the rideshare drivers, there's also the new industries of like Toro and the other rideshare where you're renting a car and someone could own, you know, 15 personal vehicles and just park them on the Evanston streets and, you know, someone with an app can kind of independently go and grab those cars. So I do think we should regulate that in some way. Um, it, it gets kind of complicated and Nick, uh, you know, this might be some some fancy legalese that has to happen to kind of differentiate between uh, some of some of some of those as well as uh, I'm thinking that again and, and also I want to be clear um, is it the desire of this committee to have some kind of a, a limitation on how many commercial vehicles uh, can uh, exist per block I'm not super enthusiastic about a block limit. If you've got five plumbers who happen to live on the same street, why limit it to having three places to park? Thank you. And I, I think, again, in the same way, we invest, do investigations for when people request, uh, um, uh, what is it again, Mike, but the, the parking. The, the disabled. Permits. Disabled parking. I think we should do some of those same investigations and um, to make sure people have exhausted all of their options on their on their property before they get you know a permit to park this vehicle on the street but if we mix in some things like that I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm fine not having a limitation and, and that's something we can include maybe with a rider or, or, or a waiver to the application so something to that effect that says uh, that the individual can notarize saying because 50% of the time they may not be the owner of the vehicle anyway so they just they just have a take-home vehicle for their from their employer so we can uh, perhaps work to have a, a waiver, a right, or something to that effect where they would notarize saying, I, Mike Rivera, living at 123 Main Street, am registering this Ford F-150 that is my provided to me by my company, and and then I would, I would pay for my wheel tax and pay for my permit for that year, and that would be registered to my home. And I don't have a place to park it. I don't have a driveway, and I don't have a, a parking pad or a garage. And then at that point, we could uh, approve based on that information that they're uh, providing to us and, and notarizing to be true. My, my, my problem with that is, um, if, sorry, is that if there is a, you know, if someone doesn't have a, a driveway or a parking pad, they can obviously park on the street under what we're talking about here. But, you know, if I use my garage for a wood shop or for, I don't know, some other personal use, I have some hobby and it occupies my garage, I play drums, should I be forced to put my car into my garage or I use my parking pad for a pool in the summer and my kids hop around in the pool, should we, you know, if the car is allowed to be on the street in the circumstances of someone not having it, I mean, we should allow people just to make their own decisions and either, you know, ban a certain size vehicle or whatever it is or, you know, the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile from sitting out uh, on the street. but. Similar vehicles should have similar rights either park on the street or a parking pad if available. I mean, and I think we, ha we do similar considerations for other things. So I think it's consistent with what we, what we already do, one. And, and two, um, I think the difference is it's commercial use. And so, again, f for me, fundamentally, like, the employer should be providing p a parking space for this vehicle. It is not in this instance, and therefore this person – is deciding to use street parking to do it, which is fine, but that you're not necessarily, you know, in, in you know, we, we don't have to allow it. Clearly, we have restrictions in place already for it. So, because because it's acknowledging that this is different than a residential parking. This is commercial parking, and again, in, in most places, they, you know, the employer provides commercial parking at the business site, you know, on location. 
or if you're taking home, you know, the employer and you should work to find space on your property to park this vehicle or find somewhere nearby that you can where you can rent out a space. So there's many different options for someone that wants to 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 park a commercial vehicle. This is one of them. This is probably the most convenient one, but it's not the only option. And I do think that Mr. Rivera's uh, manager Rivera's uh, suggestion makes sense with the waiver. So that seems like a solid compromise. Council member uh, Kelly Okay, uh, is there any further discussion on this item? Mike, uh, Manager Rivera, do you have everything you need to? I, I do, thank you. Okay. And then uh, we do have one member for public comment for APW2. I'm sorry, what time was this committee to end? Uh, so okay, yeah. Okay, we're already over. Uh, Ms. Allen? Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for your time again tonight. Um, I think most of you know my story. I suffered a um, complete sewer failure in uh, early 2021, and the cost to repair it was $45,000. Um, I live on Elgin Road, which is actually golf, which is a state road, and that they had to dig um, up almost 20 feet below the road to fix it, including two and a half days of traffic control etc. I think you've all heard this a number of times. Um, I've been in touch with you for, you know, since since that time, since it happened in early, in early 2020. I've come to many meetings. And my hope tonight is that um, there can be some resolution to decide on financial assistance. We eat salads, not, not big hearty foods. Excuse me? I think there's um, someone hoping. who's just unmuted. You're fine to keep going. Okay. Um, um, I'm hoping that tonight there can be some resolution to decide on how to provide some financial assistance to people in my situation. And I think um, previous proposals seemed fair. They were based on income. They're based on um, uh, percentage of you know uh, income, et cetera. And um, I, I just feel like no one, I, I've, we've been talking about this for, for, for several meetings. I just feel like there's no one that should have to liquidate a life insurance policy to pay for, to have a fully functioning sewer. And um, I, I don't want to see anybody else in this situation, and I'm asking for some help um, on the uh, on the amount that I had to pay to fix this. I, I know that the Director Stoneback looked back over six years or more, and there were only about five other situations, but he doesn't know if they were 45,000 or what, how much they were because they, the permits um, were pulled for only that, that were 25,000. So, um, you know, this is not something that's going to happen to 100 people every year, hopefully. This is obviously a very rare uh, situation, and I was, uh, you know, chosen to be part of it. But I'm really hoping we can have some resolution tonight and so that no one else has to be in a situation panicked because they don't have a fluctuating toilet and they don't have the money to pay to have it fixed. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Council Member Kelly. Yeah, so Ms. Allen, I'm sorry. My, my apologies. Uh, may I first have a motion uh, on item APW2? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll move item APW2, sewer service repair costs, and this is for discussion. Okay, moved by Council Member Newsman. May I have a second? I'll second. Uh, seconded by Council Member Kelly. Uh, thank you. Uh, and then uh, Council Member Kelly. So, I just want to say I'm sorry that we're still discussing this. I thought by now we should be acting on this. I think um, Mr. Stonebeck did provide a very reasonable plan on a sliding a scale based on income, and I think absolutely we should be moving forward on this, and I hope we can do this without too much more delay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. What do we – so, yes, I, I'd like to see us – get this up for action soon. I think we, you, uh, Mr. Stonebeck already provided um, a way that this can be handled. So, Last time we discussed this, we asked for some additional information, which is provided tonight. Yeah, look at uh, it's page three of six of this particular item in the packet, which is page 195 of 198. Uh, so at the January 10th meeting, staff was requested to provide responses to, looks like, four questions, five questions. Um, 
Yeah, number one, uh, what is the cost to have a plumber determine the location and depth of a sewer service? Ballpark $200 is the answer. Uh, do other municipalities provide financial assistance programs for sewer repairs? Uh, of the surveyed 20 communities, uh, only two of the 20 surveyed communities uh, do provide assistance. Uh, number three, how much does sewer service insurance cost and what does the insurance cover? Uh, annual cost ranges from $100 to $150. Uh, coverage is another question. Uh, it depends. Uh, long story short, it depends. Uh, number four, provide more information on what financial assistance the city currently provides. And as I understand it, there is some financial assistance available uh, through CDBG programs in those uh, areas of town that are eligible. Uh, zero interest loans in the maximum amount of $50,000. So this would help some low income residents. Uh, and the last question we asked for clarification on was if the city provides a grant for the expensive sewer repair uh, recently completed and um, then we modify the city code, would we be liable uh, retroactively, essentially? And uh, the recommendation is to know, make it clear that we would not be. Okay. Uh, any further? That we wouldn't be li liable? I'm reading that different. What do you mean by? Retroactively. We wouldn't be retroactively liable. If somebody had a, a burdensome uh, and expensive sewer repair cost three years ago, they would not be eligible. Uh, any further discussion on this? Yeah, see, that actually, uh, I think that Burns. was in Sorry about that. I think that was an attempt to answer my question. My ask, my question was a little different. It was actually like if we pass some, if we provide relief for this resident, then we pass, we change, update the code to adopt these recommendations, and then someone has an issue in the future. Can they then come back and say, "Hey, you helped this resident. You need to help me in the same way." Or because we've updated the code at that point to say, "Look, this is how we're going to handle these." situations we're going to encourage you to get insurance etc um, you know how would that work council Cummins uh, good evening and again members of the uh, APW committee uh, Nicholas Cummings city attorney uh, this is ultimately a policy decision by the council but um, as the city's attorney and uh, I was accused of giving conservative advice earlier this afternoon um, I would not recommend providing any financial assistance prior to changing the city code because you then sort of set a precedence uh, once you do provide it without the city code being changed for other people to say well you help this person why can't you help me as well um, and then we could point to the city code and say well the city code says you're not eligible but at that point we've already opened Pandora's box to provide assistance to other people and we would not be good stewards of, of the Treasury um, by doing it that way so you're saying there's an opportunity for us to, to change the code, then pro provide the relief for this resident, and then you're saying we'd be fine. We, we would not be liable yes. for future claims. Because whatever criteria we set in the code, hopefully this particular resident will, will meet that criteria, um, and then they can receive that assistance. Um, but in the event that we provided the assistance prior to changing the city code, any and everyone could then ask because we don't have those parameters in place I think the problem is if it, I don't know if the change allows for any assistance of this time of this kind unless I'm misunderstanding we, what we would be so changing. before ma offering any assistance we would have to change the code when we change the code we could say for repairs after this date so we'd be able to help Ms. Allen because she's already paid for her repair you're not suggesting we exclude her. Correct. We can no. write into the code saying, you know, like you said, you know, with a look, a five-year look back or something along those lines. You, uh, the city council can set the statute of limitations. Right. Right. Yeah. For something like this. Okay, oh, I see. I mean, and city council is also going to, have to probably pass a budget amendment, amendment to make sure we actually have funds uh, to do it. Yeah. So yeah. all of that would need to be, or is recommended to be done prior to giving any sort of financial assistance. 
So I think that I guess that sounds good. I mean, I'm, I'm curious what the rest of the committee feels, and then everything else looks good. I mean, I and I know Miss Allen, you, I don't know if this was you or someone else who thought the insurance um, is really expensive, and it seems like what we have oh. here. Yeah, it's not expensive. That's okay. I, me I mentioned that in my emails to you and, okay. and at the previous meeting. It's not okay. expensive to buy the insurance, but it only covers typically up to ten thousand dollars in sewer repair, no more. Mm. And um, the um, the amount, of the, the type of plumber you need to detect what, where. In my case, I had several regular residential plumbers come to try to fix the problem. And yes, that's right, one hundred sixty, two hundred, three hundred dollars, whatever. But they couldn't find where the problem was. I had to hire a company that is is much more um, advanced and much more um, uh, has a lot different type of equipment before they could find the problem 20 feet, you know, under Golf Road, and that was at a significantly more a higher cost. So to ask homeowners to do that before you know paying their transfer tax or whatever is is I don't know how that would go over very well. And so just to, to be clear, number one and number three, my, I recall the, the, the point of that was to respond to this particular case, and it, it shouldn't have been too general. We needed to – so I just – I want to – I would love to hear staff's response to that because the, my understanding was that we were going to go out and try to find the – determine the cost of a plumber in this – you know, that would need to come out and investigate this situation. And so are we confident? Well, I can tell you my cost. In order, when they finally diagnosed the problem, that the, 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 the clay pipe was disconnected from the main under Golf Road, that particular plumber, that cost me $1,500. So $45,000 does not include all the different plumbers I had out first, tried to fix, diagnose it, and fix it. So um, <clears throat> if you're going to require people, to, when they're selling their homes, to have this type of work done in order to... Um, Especially those who might live on the, you know, at-risk areas, it could be much more expensive than three hundred or two hundred dollars um, to do this. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, Director, Manager, Stone, Deputy Manager Stonebeck, and then Councilmember Keller. I just, if if the city were to pass something like this, uh, I'm not sure where the funding would come from to pay this back. So it. It places an unrecognizable liability on the city that if we, you know, yes, we, Miss Allen is the only one in 2021, but say we have one in 2022 and we have another one in 2023, that's potentially, you know, $30,000 each year that's coming out of a budget that it's not budgeted for. And then all the, I guess we would have to raise the sewer rate to be able to afford paying this. And again, as the infrastructure gets older, we're, the city will probably recognize more situations of this nature. It, and again, it, it depends on the age of the, of the pipe and its location, but it, the, all sewer pipes are going to fail at some point or another. And if you do this, you are just placing the city at a liability, and right now there is, you know, it's not programmed into any funding source to pay for this. So uh, we we do allocate seventy-five thousand dollars a year in the sewer fund for emergency sewer repairs. That's contemplated on repairing the city's sewers. Uh, some years we don't we don't spend all seventy-five thousand, but last year we exceeded that seventy-five thousand by quite a bit. So. Uh, again, there's just a, a lack of dedicated funding for a program such as this. If I'm going to go to Councilmember Kelly, but if, oh, oh, Miss Allen, one second, I'm sorry, apologies. Sorry. I'm going to go to Councilmember Kelly, but uh, I do have a quick point of information. Uh, you know, let's say that this, you know, on average was to happen. I think Miss Allen mentioned you did a look back of the last six years and came up with, oh, three years and came up with six people? Uh, or no. came up with it? It was five years and came up with six people, I believe. Five years came up with six people. So we're looking at about an average of one or so per year, which could be up to 40, you know, or so thousand, fifty thousand um, dollars. In order to, in, in order to raise Director Stoneback, um, uh, roughly fifty thousand dollars in water 
uh, and sewage uh, rate funds. Um, could we, you know, is that is that like a very small incremental? I mean, to the average user, would that be a few pennies per user to raise the additional fifty thousand dollars a year to cover this? Yes, it would be. So, I mean, I think if we're, yeah, I think that's not a huge burden on all of our taxpayers to say that if one of our neighbors has a situation like this, that we're all going to chip in a few pennies uh, on our sewer bill to ensure that no one who lives in our city has to go through this. I, I think that's a reasonable ask uh, to take care of this utility. Councilmember Kelly and then Councilmember Burns. So I just want to say I'd like to um, refer this back to this committee the next meeting for action, for introduction and action. Um, and I guess then I'd like to direct staff to um, prepare, I guess, what Mr. Stonebeck's already prepared in terms of this um, the sewer repair um, program. And I'll, you know, it's I already it written up. So I just, I would, since it's already here, we don't need to go through um, referrals because we've already discussed it at this committee. So I'd like to refer it back to this committee for action. And I'm not, and, and yeah, the funding, I, um, we can find the funding. Uh, Director Stonebeck, is that uh, a possibility? Was it, will it? Uh, well, a city code has to be modified, which has not been contemplated in any of the memos I wrote. What would potentially be written into the city code is somewhat developed. So uh, I would have to ask the legal department whether or not they believe that they could craft an ordinance within actually it's only one week because the packet comes out you know it's only a few starts getting I mean we could probably come back in March if that's acceptable March 14th would be a much more realistic time that's fine so okay. one month from now so okay so we'll have this back at the is that an actual meeting date of this committee uh, I'm almost certain it is yes okay so that the well, that, let's just say the second meeting in March. The first, or the first meeting. meeting. I'm sorry. The first meeting in March. We will have uh, this back on the agenda for uh, uh, action, Councilmember Kelly. Um, okay. Um, yes. I'm oh, sorry, Councilmember. Is it? Is that all? Are you done, Councilmember Kelly? That's all. Okay. Uh, Councilmember. I look forward to voting on this. Councilmember Burns. Yes, I, I want to be clear. Like I, I personally, I'm I'm comfortable providing, seeing if there's a path to provide relief for Miss Allen. I am not um, comfortable at this point um, uh, a, approving a a permanent um, assistance program if there is insurance that is affordable for our residents, which is why. We asked for that information, and so what between now and the next meeting, what I would like to see is I want to make sure that we have uh, accurate numbers here for both, both question one and three. Because um, again, what what we ask for is to, if if someone if a plumber would need to go out and, and locate the depth of a sewer service that was in a situation similar to Ms. Allen, what would that cost? So at the next meeting, that's what I would like to see. Right. And then one, one sec. And then for question three, how much does sewer service insurance cost? Again, insurance for someone that's in a situation that Miss Allen described. So those are the two questions that I would like. If these are good numbers, because Miss Allen is saying different numbers, I think fifteen hundred or something like that, and these are very different than what I'm hearing. Point, yeah, so just point, point of information. I, I will say that uh, I think what Miss and then Director Stoneback. And Manager Stoneback is next. But uh, I think what Ms. Allen said, I think these numbers are accurate. Even Ms. Allen confirmed uh, that. I think the concern was, as she said, yes, the uh, sewer insurance is uh, uh, fairly inexpensive, but it only covers up to $10,000, which these expenses very easily go much higher than that. And so I don't see that here, though. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So, so uh, oh, I'll, I'll let Director Can you Stoneback. confirm, is that what, what you found in your research? So on question one, the, the cost to determine the location and depth of the sewer is about $200. To find the cause of the break that Ms. Allen ex experienced cost more because her sewer line was already broken. Uh, and as such, there's water in it. And, and so it's a lot more difficult to do. So if your sewer service is in good condition when you purchase a home, uh, you can have the sewer line inspected to determine its condition and its depth and its location for about $200. Okay, that's hold the, there for a second. And then anything else would just be 
what you need to do for due diligence as someone who is looking into purchasing a home. So I think for for what your recommendation was, not the one that I think Council Member Kelly has, has asked to, to, to move forward, but you were saying that at some point there would be an affidavit that someone signed saying that they, you know, hired a plumber, that they went out and determined the depth of the sewer. And you're saying we could do that, the homeowner or somebody looking to buy a home, however it works, could do that for $200. That is correct. So one of the alternatives, instead of developing a program, was to require when a, when a house was sold that the purchaser of the house was made aware of the location and depth of their sewer service of the home that they're purchasing so that they would be aware of to whether or not they should buy insurance. It's, there are, I don't know, probably six or seven companies that provide sewer insurance. You can sometimes you can get it as a rider onto your actual own homeowner's insurance. And each insurance company provides a different level of of what they're insuring. And staff does not have the wherewithal to, to, to go and look up each one and read the fine print on each one to, to give a report on what insurance does. Homeowners should be responsible to do that work on their own. I think the problem is 10000 and 40000 is such a big jump that have we at least found one insurance company, you know, that is no. that will cover up to 40000 No, I, I have not. Think so. and, then, and I looked. And then what we're proposing, the you know, the homeowner, if they're over the 120% of the medium AMI range, okay, they would have to pay $10,000 out of pocket. They would have to get $25,000 loan from the city so that's still money that they're paying out that's thirty five thousand dollars and then the city is paying anything over ten thousand dollars so in this case the city would pay ten thousand dollars and then the homeowner would pay ten thousand dollars but borrow another twenty five from the city which they would have to repay so the amount the city's going to pay you know i'm assuming miss allen is over the 120 percent ami i don't know that for a fact that's correct. But, but then the city would pay her $10,000. How much would the insurance company pay her? $10,000. And then she could get a loan for twenty-five. And she would get a loan for $25,000. A point of, point of information, uh, just to recenter this. Oh, Don, I broke my mask. Uh, if I was a, uh, if I was, were a homeowner on a non-state road or in a, you know, normal road with normal, sewer depth and all of that and the same exact issue were to happen to me who would pay the homeowner the homeowner would but still it would pay be about ten thousand dollars it would be eight to ten thousand dollars but the cost would be roughly eight to ten thousand dollars correct so the, so the, the cost becomes more expensive when the sewer depth is greater than 10 foot in depth and and why is the sewer that depth at her what what, what causes the sewer to be that depth again it, gravity gravity it's how <laughs> the the closer you are to where you connect to the metropolitan water reclamation district's sewer so the sewer that miss allen connects to uh, ends at emerson and mccormick but it goes all the way north to crawford and central approximately so crawford and central it's only four foot deep so it's to get that sewage to flow downhill, by the time it's front of Miss Allen's property, it's about 20 foot deep. So it's just because she happens to live in a spot where because of how we have to do our business to move the solid waste and all that stuff through the city, she just happened to draw the short end of the stick in the part mm -hmm. of time. Right. So with, with that in mind, I think, again, as neighbors, to create an Evanston that is for everyone, regardless of your neighborhood, regardless of if you live at the end of the... Uh, sewer transmission line or you live at the beginning of the sewer transmission line, you should pay a similar amount. So if it's, you know, eight to ten thousand dollars for a homeowner who lives at the beginning of the line, it should be eight to ten thousand dollars for a homeowner at the end of the line. And we should ensure that our sewer rates are uh, created in a manner that creates that kind of equity. We shouldn't arbitrarily charge people, leave people on the hook for a lot more just because they're, you know, in the wrong part of town. But, uh, and it's because it's a house that I could afford, you know, and, and busy road, but it was a house I could afford. 
but no one's going to suspect. You'd never go into the situation thinking, oh, it's a busy road, so the sewer must be really deep, and if something happens, no one would think that way. No, no, home, no home purchaser would be would go through that mental and, gymnastics. And, and and yeah, yeah. So uh, with that, I, I think the proposal that we should be looking at is a proposal to make sure that you know there's a certain amount that homeowners across the city pay and that anything over that we can figure out how to how to cover the cost um, and that's not what the current proposal okay. is and if you want a proposal like that then it would take but longer. it is reflecting income the current proposal has an income component to it well but i mean again you know no, i don't know if income in this case because it is Because this is a necessity of how we move uh, our, our sewage throughout the city, I, I think, uh, or our water, whatever it is, I'm sorry, sewer or water line, I don't know, whichever one it is, sewer line, because this is a necessity of government function, uh, I think we should try to create some equity in how, what folks are on the hook for across the city. So regardless it, I think of the it, current proposal does this, though, is my, it, that's how I understand it. Well, no, because in this proposal, even in this, uh, Yes, she'd get ten. There, whoever would get ten thousand dollars from the city, ten thousand dollars from the insurance. I guess a, a normal person would mm -hmm. would get ten would get ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars if they did have insurance. Would get ten thousand dollars from the insurance. It would be completely covered uh, by the insurance, um, and so that would be you know the average cost for an average Evanstonian. I think what we should figure out is what is the average. What would be the average cost for an Evanstonian of sewer repair, and 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 not make folks pay over that. Regardless well, I do appreciate the income component. I mean, if you really are just barely making and all of a sudden you get hit with huge costs, I think there should be a greater contribution to help repair something that's, that we're, if you happen to be living in a spot where it's going to end up costing you a, a lot of money. Versus, I mean, I think it, I think there is some justification for having that component in, in this. Proposal. Well, certainly if you're low income, we want to take care of you, but I'm saying just because again, you live at the end of the line, whether the end of the line happens to be a wealthy neighborhood or a poor neighborhood, uh, we should... Yes, I agree. It, yeah. We should have, it should apply to everybody, but I also think we should. And then also, yeah, and to Councilmember Burns, to your point earlier about taking care of Ms. Allen before we create a, a, a policy change, uh, that was an issue that was raised by our Corporation Council that we would set a press, if we did that before we changed the policy, we'd set a precedent which would potentially open the, uh, almost quite literally here, the floodgates. Uh, I, I think we've reached the, I'll ask my questions offline because this is, okay. Uh, my, yeah, questions aren't really being addressed um, directly if we spent enough time on this. Okay. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on this item? So, so, yeah, so I get, well, so then what is coming back to us? What do we want coming back to us? Do we want... I would like to see um, Mr. S the, the proposal is written by Mr. Stonebeck, but I agree with you, um, Devon, that Councilmember Reed, that it should be applied to anybody, regardless of income. But I would like to—I mean, so that anybody c would benefit. But I think there should also be um, some consideration for low income, where it could be a greater contribution. Uh, Deputy Manager Stonebeck, Chair, can 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 he just, especially for the community, just clearly state what the current recommendation is that we're Yes. We're discussing. Sure. Is it indicated on page 194 of 198 of the Administration Public Works packet, there's a table at the bottom of that that if you're in the AMI uh, less than 80, you would pay $0 out of pocket, receive a 25, have to take out a $25,000 mortgage, and then that's it. You just repaid a twenty-five thousand dollar loan. If you're between eighty and one hundred and twenty AMI, you'd have to pay five thousand dollars out of pocket, uh, receive a twenty-five thousand dollar loan, and then anything over thirty thousand dollars, the city picks up. If you're over one hundred and twenty percent of AMI, you pay a ten thousand dollars out of pocket, receive a twenty-five thousand dollar loan and then the city picks up any cost over $35,000. The loan is from the city. 
the loan is from the city. Paid back on your sewer bill. Uh, it's a deferred no. or amortized loan that would have to be decided. Okay. And a point of information and clarity for Councilmember Kelly. See, my, my point there was that even that low income person who, again, happens to live at the end of the line is on the hook for, t it, even if they, it's a no interest loan, they still have to pay $25,000. I do not think that is fair, particularly if that low income person just happened to live on the other side of the town that was not at the end of the line. I think we have to make sure that we're creating some equity and not charging folks, again, just for living in the wrong part of town. But Thank you. Councilman, because yeah, I'm sorry, Ms. Allen. Councilman, you come out of the, the previous in previous meetings. You said that if the, it would come out of the cost when I sell my home, that there would be a lien against my home. So if I sell it, twenty five thousand dollars would be taken out of the sale of my home, which could make the cost of your home more. Uh, less affordable. Okay, Ms. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, I agree with you, Councilmember Reed. So I think that it needs should be modified to not um, unduly um, and negatively impact people depending on where they live. Absolutely. So I think, I think that means it's not all loan, correct? That there's um, that it would be covered by the city as opposed to loan. I agree, uh, Nick. Uh, I just, I just wanted to point out to the committee that generally whenever, and it's not just the city, whenever a government body provides a loan, regardless of its interest rate, there is generally a second secondary lien on the property. Um, so, you know, IDA with its housing assistance program, it creates a lien, a secondary mortgage on the property. Um, you know, NSP, when we had NSP funding, same thing. So I just want to make the committee aware of that. that that's not atypical. Thank you. All right, so uh, what do we, so if we're having this come back on the 14th, I think we can close out discussion now. Are we looking for, uh, is it the consensus of the committee that we want uh, to put a cap on what a resident has to pay, which I think, you know, we should figure out what that average cost is. If it's $10,000, if it's $15,000, and make sure that a resident pays no more than that. Um, is, is that what we want to do, or do we want to do this uh, schedule uh, where folks would be on the line? Uh, I think Councilman Raquel, we know where you stand, but go ahead. Uh, I, I, but I am also, reference. since Ms. Allen has studied this much more, even more in depth than all of us, <laughs> I'd love to hear what her opinion is on, on what she would like well, to see. I, I think we know Ms. Well, the cap. No, it's, yeah. no, but she studied this a lot. I think well, the residents bring a lot. But anyway, yes, I want a cap, and um, absolutely we should have a cap. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Newsom. Thank you. If we're contemplating a cap, we need to do more research so we know what the numbers are. Okay. I'm not inclined to go down that road since we have numbers in front of us that seem reasonable to me. Uh, and I'm not sure how we would find those numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just don't know. I perceive that when you submit for a permit, you're providing a cost range, but I, I don't, I haven't looked at those numbers to be able to tell you whether I'm not going to be able to find the average cost for a sewer repair. Or, or we can set a reason, whatever we think are reasonable. We can use some inference to set whatever are reasonable. If it's, I, I heard the number, I don't know where it came from, Ms. Allen, are you uh, six to $10,000? I don't know where that number Eight came from. Eight to 10,000 if Eight my house 10, were on a side street. So if we where, can figure out something. the pipes are usually eight, you know, eight, six or eight feet deep, not, not 15, 16, 20 feet deep. Yeah, if we can. I don't know where she got that number from. Yeah, okay. Well, if we can. Uh, my plumber. If we can use some kind of methodology, I'll be happy to work to try to figure that out. It maybe doesn't have to come back in a month. Councilmember Burns. Uh, I mean, I'm fine with whatever, you know, if it sounds like you and uh, Councilmember Kelly want more information, I'm fine with that. I'm going to do my own research on this and hopefully come back with some some information about insurance and, and some other things that I'm interested in. But I'm, I'm if y'all are seeking additional information, that's fine with me. Okay, so then uh, I guess we will uh, we'll still work to have this come back on the 14th. If not, it will be delayed, but we'll do, try to get the right thing done uh, for a permanent policy. So uh, with that. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm supposed to bring back on the 14th now. Uh, I guess if, if the committee's fine, uh, Director uh, Manager Stoneback and I and whoever else is interested can continue conversations and um, you know do a bit more. I guess what, what you'll be bringing back on the 14th is uh, more information. It seems like I would like to offer the following suggestion: 
uh, which is what Councilmember Kelly originally proposed, is that staff come back with uh, the legislative language that embodies the uh, proposal that we have been discussing now for two or three months. Uh, at the same time, if there is additional information that uh, can be made available to further inform that discussion, uh, let's take advantage of that information, but let's not come back uh, in in a month without something that we can vote on if we like it. I, I yes, thank you for that. Uh, I know that I personally would not vote for this. I think if we're going to make a change, if we're going to have staff work on something, we should you know be coming toward uh, something that meets our equity goals uh, and 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 gets the job done in a more permanent fashion. I wouldn't be supportive of this particular proposal. Uh, I think it is trying to make the best out of a pretty rough situation, but just understanding the uh, mechanics of this, uh, I wouldn't be super supportive. I think Councilmember Kelly is in a similar I mean, can, did, did you just take a poll on the idea of a cap here? Did we do yes. a straw poll and it was favorable? I think it was favorable. I think Councilmember Burns was on the fence. Because if that's the case, I would say come back with one that includes a cap. Like, why not? If we're all saying right here, if we're the majority of us think that's the good way to go, then let's, let's, I mean, yeah, it can okay. always be amended. Well, I'm not anywhere right now. I'm saying if, if you are seeking additional information for staff, I guess you have the ability to do that. I'm not, I'm going to go off and seek information well, then, here, for let, myself and come back ready to have this discussion again when it comes back. So that's let, let's, I'm let's do this. I, I make a motion uh, to, or, or if, if someone, Council Member Kelly, can make a motion to, uh, set the cap at not more than fifteen thousand dollars. We can figure out, you know, we can leave, that'll leave some leeway for staff to do some research between now and then. Uh, but I think a cap of fifteen thousand uh, dollars may be fair, and then the city would pick up uh, the cost above that. Uh, and then I, I still think the other requirements to uh, about the insurance and all of that stuff makes sense. The only thing I'd want to change about this policy is getting rid of the. The twenty-five thousand dollar loan. We can leave the we can leave a loan for certain folks. We can even make it income eligible. But I, I think the big thing is that we should cap it at about fifteen thousand dollars for any resident of Evanston. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's life saving. I'll second that. Is that a motion? I'll second that. Do you want to make it? Chair, I thought make. you made it. Can you make it? So I'm okay. so moved. Second. No, I'm asking. Okay, I move. So okay, moved. so moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, and then all those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed. Nay. Uh, seeing, uh, hearing the ayes, having it. Uh, on the 14th, we will have a policy that sets a 15,000 dollar cap for uh, what a resident would have to pay and then completes all of the other stuff that was uh, proposed and for the city a lot more liability and then uh, i guess the information we want is an estimate of what the liability annually could be um, based on you know your research of how many of these cases have happened in the past Okay, thank you. Thank you, Director Stumbeck. Uh, seeing no further business before us, um, our meeting is concluded and planning and development will start in five minutes.